All right, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Loud and clear, okay. Yeah, there is, uh, there is uh, two Dakotas, a uh, north and a south, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, that's always good to get recognition for that. Uh, my name is Josh. Uh, I did leave the title off on purpose. Um, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all. Uh, first time I've been in a, a room with a lot of people in quite some time, as I'm as I sure it is for many of you. So it's been a great opportunity to get here. Uh, Augusta is beautiful from the back of a lift at 1 a.m., so I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of it today uh, as we get going. Uh, as Phil said, uh, here to represent the Open Information Security Foundation. Uh, that is a mouthful, the OISF, which is the foundation that supports Suricata. Uh, so thank you, Phil, Doug, and everyone for Security Onion for this opportunity and, and for everything that you do. Um, my main goal today, uh, other than to just fill some time, is to talk mainly about Suricata, uh, to focus about or on threats, and to talk about Suricata metadata. So, so hopefully if you are a user of Suricata, uh, you'll see some additional capabilities that maybe you didn't know were there, if you're not a user, maybe this will get you to consider it and maybe consider it using it in ways that you didn't maybe, uh, maybe expect. Um, outside of this, uh, I guess just a little bit of background for me. Um, I also teach at a university in South Dakota. We do cyber, uh, much like uh, the universities here in, in Augusta. Uh, retiring from the Iowa Air National Guard, so I just eclipsed 20 years this uh, last summer. I'm now in the obligatory grow my hair until I can put it in a ponytail phase. Uh, I don't know if it's going well. My kids say it looks awful, but I'm gonna, I said it's at least a year commitment now. Uh, I could commit 20 to the guard, I could commit a year to my hair. Um, and uh, do some threat re research for HP, uh, formerly Bromium. They got acquired by the HP giant a couple of years ago. Uh, endpoint protection through micro-virtualization. Uh, I could talk about that all day as well. Um, and then uh, some trainings and such. Okay, so a little bit about OISF. Uh, it is a US-based 501c3. It is the foundation that is tasked right now solely with supporting the Suricata project. Uh, it is dedicated to providing that, that platform for the ongoing development of Suricata. Uh, that includes a variety of full-time and part-time developers, um, contractors, uh, other support staff, uh, folks like me. I don't do anything with the development in Suricata. I have a development history, but uh, you probably don't want me writing code at this point in my career. Um, so it's the organization that makes it all happen. Uh, the foundation and the project itself is um, supported totally by the community, uh, both directly through financial support, consortium membership, attendance to our conference, um, as well as uh, co contributions. A lot of the significant contributions and ideas for the project have come from the community, those out there using it day in and day out. Uh, we have some forums. We went ahead and set up a discourse, not a discord, although we are wrestling with our discord right now, um, in order to provide a community space. Uh, this was the first pivot from IRC, so I'm really proud of the team that <laughs> we were able to pivot off of IRC. I no longer have to open up Jabber. Um, and, uh, and we can use, I guess, a browser to get to these forums. So please consider joining. Uh, a lot of great conversation. The community's there. It, it's, a, it's an open space to talk all things Suricata. Uh, a couple weeks, we have Suricon, our annual user conference. This will be in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, so October 18th through the, well, the week of the 18th. Now I'm kind of forgetting my dates. Uh, so please consider. We've got a couple days of training leading up to the conference. The conference will have much like this, talks, uh, development discussions, roadmap planning, and it's an opportunity for the community to really come and have their voice heard on where Suricata should head next. So a little about Suricata. Uh, it was written quite a few years ago, in 2009, by uh, the now famous Victor Julian. Uh, a little bit of trivia, if you find yourself at Suricon, this might come in handy, is uh, that it was originally named VIPS, Victor's IPS, very creative. Uh, it is open source, GPLv2 on GitHub. We have a very diverse team working on uh, this project from uh, Saskatoon, Canada, to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to um, you know, parts in India. So it's an interesting and very dynamic organization. It's fun scheduling meetings and times to get together, virtual and in person, because we're, we're spanning so many time zones. Uh, pretty common deployment scenario. Again, I don't want to dwell on this too long. Uh, but looking at an elastic stack or a Splunk, you have Suricata as one of those primary data generators. Um, it's going to be placed on a network in a lot of scenarios, uh, listening to your network traffic, however you're acquiring that network traffic and sending it to it. 
and then from there, it's gonna be able to not only generate your IDS alerts, which is what most folks probably associate Suricata with, um, but then also all sorts of metadata, uh, protocol-specific logs, file identification, file extraction, it can generate PCAP. So there's quite a few things that we'll uh, I'll touch on today. Um, so it's gonna take the traffic in, it's gonna take rules, from local and external sources to help generate those alerts. It's gonna generate the outputs, which can then be fed to um, a, you know, a file beat, or there is a file beat for Suricata that, that works well, comes with some, uh, some default dashboards. Uh, you can ship it directly to Logstash, ingest it into Elastic. Since the primary output is in JSON format, it's just sort of ready to go. Um, and then begin to visualize that through tools like Kibana or, or Evebox or anything that can consume that data. So what can Suricata do? Um, most of this, if not all of this, is pretty well documented on Read the Docs, so I would encourage you to check that out if you haven't. Um, as I said, uh, pretty standards in terms of configuration and output. The configuration is YAML-based with pretty good commenting inside of it, so it's not too hard to get in there and uh, start modifying the behaviors of your Suricata deployment. The JSON, native default JSON output, easy to integrate into other workflows, SIMs, and everything else. Uh, it is multi-threaded, there is hardware acceleration available. Typically, if you're, you're thinking about hardware acceleration, uh, dedicated network interface cards and the like, um, you know, you're talking a pretty serious deployment. Native IPv6 support, some auto protocol detection. We'll talk a little bit about auto protocol detection today. Um, advanced support for a lot of the more common and popular application layer protocols, and by that, just saying that it, there is um, greater flexibility in the rules that are written, and then there's a greater amount of protocol data that's being logged as it's inspecting that network traffic. Uh, it does have the ability to do both file identification and file extraction, so it can ID files on the wire as well as then extract those, and we'll actually do that in just a few minutes. Um, this includes generating checksums on the fly, um, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2s. And NetFlow output's available upon request. It is extensible through Lua scripting, although I don't think that that's super active. Uh, IP lists, GOIP, IP reputation, uh, there's bypass rules for dealing with large flows such as streaming services. Uh, there's a community ID, we'll take a look at that as well. Uh, generation of JA3, JA3S when it comes to dealing with TLS traffic. Um, and increasing and ongoing kind of support for different SCADA protocols, especially for our ICS systems. Uh, as I said, full packet capture. So that's just a list of a few of the features. Um, what's next? Uh, we do anticipate the release of Suricata 7 to come here sometime in early 2022. Uh, the 6.0 branch, 6.x branch is what we're currently, is, is the stable. And uh, the release tempo has been usually about one major release per year. And we tried to get that out at Suricon, um, but just with some of the, the challenges this year, not quite gonna happen. Uh, we've got some trainings coming up, uh, Suricon and Boston, uh, DeepSec, Troopers, and Flowcon, those will all be virtual events. And then um, it looks like we're going to RSAC um, in San Francisco, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, if anyone has any questions along the way, please feel free to just shout out, or I, I guess you got those onions so that we can chuck them at each other, right? <laughs> okay, I'll be on the lookout then. You guys have the high ground, I don't. Okay, so hopefully uh, Wes made the appropriate sacrifices to the demos, demo gods this morning, because um, I'm gonna do a lot of demonstration today. Uh, again, if there's any trouble seeing the screen, I can see it, it looks good to me, um, but you know, I've got 40 year old eyes now, so it uh, might not look good to you, so let me know if I need to increase anything. Uh, the distribution here that I'm using um, is Selks. It's something that's homegrown from one of our core developers, one of our core QA folks, uh, Peter Manov and his company Stamus. Um, we use it for a lot of our training because it's focused on you know, showcasing Suricata. So it's a, a Linux, a Debian-based distro. Suricata is installed. Uh, typically, Peter likes to live on the edge, so we've got the 7.0 dev branch on here. Um, I guess it's his way of uh, extending his QA capabilities. Um, and, uh, and then an Elastic stack, so it's a little resource hungry, and then you know, kind of the standard stuff. We've got Kibana, and we've got some other dashboards that we'll use. Um, I don't wanna spend too much time in the browser, though. I do wanna spend a little bit more time just dealing with the raw data. Uh, you can download this from the GitHub uh, if you want this specific distro, this, this VM that I have right here. I'm happy to upload it and share it via a link, and, and I can do that as well. Some of the tools that are available, 
uh, we have Moloch, formerly known as Moloch, it's now Archimede, um, generating data on its own. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with that, but it is set up by default. Uh, we'll take a look at Evebox, that's a really lightweight um, alert manager with some ability to look at the metadata. Uh, Sirius is something very unique to Selks. It's here to help with not only managing rule sets, but then also, um, you know, other configuration for the system and some of its own kind of home-built dashboards and visualizations as well. Uh, of course, there's Kibana. What else stack wouldn't be complete without that? Um, and with that comes quite a few uh, visualizations and dashboards. So uh, again, the idea here isn't is really just to have something to showcase Suricata. Everything is really driven off of Suricata data, and so that's what we like to go with. Um, when it comes to updating those rules, that's one of the first thing I might do. Uh, Sirius is one way to do that. Uh, Got to drill down to the management side of things and Suricata, so we have sources, we have rule sets, and then we have Suricata itself. And this is a pretty standard flow. Um, the default, or kind of the go-to rule manager actually ships with Suricata, all, all recent major versions of Suricata. We'll take a look at that in a minute, Suricata update. Um, so the sources, where are we pulling our rules from? Um, with this utility, you can build rule sets, so you can take different rule sources and combine them into rule sets based off of your use case or need. Um, and then once we have updated those, uh, we do need to go ahead and not only download those, but have the utility. Typically what they do now is take all of those rule sources, they combine them into one rule file, and then write that to the file system. Uh, if Suricata is running, then you can ask it to do a live rule set reload, which stops the stops Suricata from having to stop and reinitialize. Um, in a training VM like this, uh, we just need to write them to the file system so that when we run Suricata, we're gonna work with this offline mode. Um, when we run it, then it just knows to load, of course, the most recent rule set. Um, I've already done that, but that's just one way of managing those rules. Um, the other, as I said, oh, here we go. What's going on? Hmm. Must be a new, new Mac feature. I just updated is Suricata update. So it's a command line driven way in order to do all of the same things that you would do with rules. Configure sources, add sources, enable, disable, update, uh, modify as well. So something I'm not gonna talk a lot about today, uh, but you get maybe the ET set, the ET open, ET pro, uh, all of those are alert. You wanna make some of those drop. Well, you can create modification files to modify the rules that you wanna change and then use Suricata update to manage that. Uh, and this is what ships with Suricata by default now. Now, when it comes to um, this training and demos, uh, I like to use PCAPs, because PCAPs are a little bit easier. I know what's in the traffic. Uh, I can cheat and study them in advance so that I don't have to try to figure it out on the fly. Um, it's easy to share as well. And fortunately, Suricata has an offline mode. It has the ability to process a PCAP or a directory of PCAPs. Um, you'll see some sandboxes are using that offline mode in order to capture PCAP from analysis, run the PCAP through, and then show you the alerts. Uh, some are gonna be doing it in live mode. Uh, in fact, I run a sandbox at home. I run, still run an old Cuckoo instance, um, but I run Suricata in a socket mode where I can feed the PCAP to Suricata via a Unix socket, and then I don't have the penalty of having to stop it and start it and stop it and start it post every single analysis. Um, there's some scripts here to help with that. There's a lot of cleanup. We gotta delete all the elastic data, delete some Moloch or Archimy data, doing that so that every time we run a PCAP, we're just focused on the traffic from that PCAP. Um, this could listen to, to whatever interfaces I have available to me, so live on a network, but I also don't want that right now because that would really confuse the data that I'm looking at. Uh, to get Suricata to run in offline mode, kind of, we got this little bit of an overly verbose command here, um, but the main thing is just to say dash r. Dash r and then the path to the, the pcap file or the, the directory. So that's one way to do it in offline mode. Um, the other, again, is pretty well documented to get it running, um, running it in socket mode and then feeding pcap to the socket. Uh, once this is done, this script will grep the output file. So the main output file being eve.json and it will grep that um, JSON file using JQ to filter and provide us with just the alerts. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so while this happens, um, takes a few minutes again. Uh, at this point, Suricata has to load. Um, you're seeing output right now from the engine initializing, um, from it loading all of the rules that it's configured to load, parsing the configuration file and getting ready to either you know, start listening to traffic or in this case, begin parsing the PCAP file because we, we've told it to run in offline mode. Um, any configuration errors, you start messing around with the config, you're gonna see those omitted here. You'll get pretty much anything in red likely means you need to take a look at your configuration or your setup uh, to make sure or resolve any of those issues. Um, you'll get version information, and in the case with a PCAP, you'll get confirmation once it's done that it was able to read the PCAP, the number of packets that it read, and that's, you know, absent seeing some alerts, that way you know for sure that it has read those. Uh, it takes a minute or two, and there we go. So there's our results. Uh, again, maybe not the prettiest. Uh, we're dealing at output on the command line. You know, certainly this doesn't scale well, but again, my, my whole focus here was to look at the actual data, um, and then from that data, you build things like your dashboards, your visual, visualizations, your other workflows. Um, so this, again, just a quick confirmation that uh, we do, in fact, have some alerts. And so just grepping specific fields, just like you would see in your, your visualizations and dashboards, right? We're picking out certain information to, to take action on that data, to present that data, to track it, to monitor it. Um, that's all we're seeing here. So we're just getting an important, but a, a small part of that puzzle. Uh, we have things like timestamp, we have the signature ID, we have the actual signature message, which is you know, usually your first point of contact with any sort of alert that is generated. Uh, categories, you have, of course, your source and destination IPs as well as the ports that they were talking on. Um, by default, all of this data will be in bar log .json. Of course, all of that is configurable. Uh, and if we cap that, we're gonna get just sort of this big massive mess. So we'll use JQ, I'll use JQ a lot. And uh, right now, that still doesn't help because we have a lot of data, but at least with the JQ, we can start to not only format that JSON output so it's a little bit easier to visually parse, but then also begin to query the data. And like I said, this doesn't necessarily scale well, but this gives me a good opportunity to really get down in the weeds and explore this information. Okay, on the way here, I got paranoid that I was gonna have a hard time remembering all my commands. So I made it a cheat sheet for myself. So let's start um, again by just looking at the contents of that eve.json file and using JQ to filter it down to just the event type. So the primary record that you'll see in the eve.json, the primary output type is gonna be driven by these event records and every event record will have a type. So you'll see here, I'm gonna scroll back just a little ways, there's all of the different event record types. So we have flow records, we have DNS records, we have TLS records, alert records, HTTP records, so we have protocol specific, we have lower level you know, networking events, uh, we have file information, we have alert event. And so all of these different records have quite a bit of data associated with each one that we can dig into and use to understand better, to build more context as to what happened to the traffic, to maybe the alerts that we're trying to triage. Um, there's also, Suricata itself's gonna generate st um, some stats records, um, which just can help with monitoring performance. And now, Actually, I think I have this in my history. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so now um, shift gears a little bit and focus on just the alert data. So uh, again, using something like uh, grep, real simple, um, and I'm not the, the foremost expert on grepping <laughs> or anything, uh, so please just uh, roll with me on what I'm doing here. Um, so we can grep the, uh, the log file and you know, narrow that down. We can just get our event types, we'll, which will give us our alert records. So that record will just be written on a line and we'll be able to redirect that through JQ. And further, so we could go, before I do all that, 
I could just look at the structure of an alert. Um, now, some of these have to deal with file downloads. In particular, you may have noticed there's a PE file download. Uh, PE files typically are quite large, so the data just sort of fills up my terminal history, and so we're gonna have to pipe it through more just to deal with it. Um, but here you can see now um, just the raw event record for, in, in this case, we have the alert. It is for a JE3 hash, and there's all the information, again, that you might expect to be around that alert that isn't always necessarily present inside of the visualizations or the dashboards that you're looking at. Um, we have a flow ID. We'll talk about the flow ID. The flow ID will help us to pivot, kind of take a step back and see in a slightly broader context what happened um, around that alert, um, around that particular flow. And this data is generated regardless of the event type. So this happens to be an alert, but if we were just looking at a file info or an anomalous event or um, a TLS record, right, the same information is still being generated. So this really, the only thing that's unique to this alert record is the alert data, um, which is all organized a little bit further down in this record. Uh, we have the des IP, destination port, the protocol, uh, the community ID, which can be used for further data correlation with other platforms. Um, further information broken down very granularly about that alert that generated, uh, such as the action, the signature, some of the metadata. In this case, um, the alert was generated due to TLS traffic, TLS certificate. So with the alert, we have information about the TLS certificate, um, and you can probably see there's some things that really stand out as odd. Uh, of course, there was some information just previous, I'll scroll back a little bit, that was also kind of odd, such as the destination port. Um, information then, uh, you know, when we get into TLS traffic, um, we lose visibility, especially if we're not able to do any sort of um, inspection into that traffic, uh, but there's still certificate information that can be parsed out and turned into either rules for, um, you know, rules for signatures, as, as you're seeing here, this is a, a J3 alert, um, or any other, you know, sort of visualization dashboard or data point that you would want to hunt on. Uh, it also generates things like J3 and J3S, uh, a really, you know, interesting technology from Salesforce. You can go to their GitHub and read a little bit more about it, um, but just taking certain elements of the certificate, putting them together, generating a hash, and saying that that hash is, could be unique enough to help you identify threats or, or hunt for threats. So in this case, somebody created that J3 SIG saying, uh, we think this is unique enough. Uh, there's also some flow information. Uh, I'm gonna scroll down here. Again, there's a PE file, so there's a lot of content. The actual payload, since this, um, or no, this isn't the PE file, I'm sorry, never mind. Getting to the PE file. There we go. Oh, was that a PE? No, that wasn't. Okay, I may have lost my spot there for a moment, but this is where I wanted to get. Um, so we have another alert. Uh, again, I kind of skipped over reading those alerts to you, but there was a handful of alerts for the download of a PE file, and then there was an, a couple of alerts for the J3 hash, indicating some potential anomalous, malicious TLS traffic. Um, for these that have to deal then with the actual PE file, uh, we have all of that same information that we were just talking about. Um, we have, in addition, if any flow bits were set, flow bits being a way to tie alerts together. So maybe one rule doesn't alert, but it sets a flow bit. Another rule sees if that flow bit is set, then it can, if it matches in its rule syntax, then it can generate the alert. Um, going a little bit further here again, now this is where the PE file is, so just a little painful on the terminal. Uh, we also get into file information. So Suricata has identified this as a file and has provided some minimal information about this particular file. Uh, the file name, based off of the HTTP response, so of course this can be completely nonsensical or gibberish. Um, it, this is a good example. We have a .pdf extension, but the file magic that was compared against that HTTP response buffer um, says that no, this is actually a PE file. So the extension in the name, you know, that's all dependent upon how that HTTP response was sent. Um, libmagic, we have that information available. So in this case, this PE file was returned not only 
not on a secure connection, but also unobfuscated. So we just had a PE file that we're able to identify here on the network. Um, this is some of the basic information, right? CERCOT also has the ability to extract the file, uh, to generate file information, and we'll see that um, two parts. There's a file info record, and then there's also uh, the file extraction capability. Okay, this is, I'm gonna go back. So, I'm gonna drop one more time. Signature ID is supposed to be a unique ID for every signature in your rule set. Um, and Suricata has a way of deconflicting. And likely when the, the engine um, initializes, it'll tell you that there's a deconflicting rule based off of the signature ID, and then it'll take whichever one, I think it takes whichever one has the most recent created date or the last one that it processed. I don't, I forget exactly what it does, um, but the idea is that everything should be unique. Uh, if we ever need to look at those, again, just doing it from the command line. Um, in the case of CELCS, it's going to write this rules file to etc suricata rules serious dot rules. Uh, suricata update will write that by default to var lib suricata rules suricata dot rules. Um, so you might have to search a little bit based off of your distro, uh, but we can grep that and based off of the SID, and we should see a single rule. So as we're trying to understand what you know Suricata is telling us with the data, we're trying to process it. We have something a little bit more discrete, like an alert. Uh, we can use that SID to dig into the rule to understand what exactly did this match on. Now it isn't always easy. You have to be able to understand the rule syntax a bit. Um, sometimes, as in a J3 rule, it's it's fairly straightforward and that it just has a value for the J3 hash. So somewhere, someone along the way said, this hash is bad, let's write a rule for it. Um, you can get into other rules that are gonna be quite a bit more complex. Uh, but again, it's just, it's just pattern matching, it's just content matching. So it's, it's really nothing that is uh, um, you know, t terribly complex, I don't think. Okay, so let's go back to those alerts for a minute. And using JQ, I'm gonna, again, try to distill those results a little bit and provide just the signature as well as the flow ID and then the signature ID. I don't really need the signature ID anymore. I, I had that earlier to show you how to grep into the rule file. Really what I want is the flow ID right now. Um, so here's the alerts that were generated for this particular PCAP. As you can see, it, it looks like possible dry decks, and it was. Um, we have a couple of J3 hash alerts. We have um, three alerts that are in relation to, you know, PE file download, an executable or a DLL. When we look at the flow, we can see that all of those alerts are actually associated with the same flow. And that, that kind of makes sense. When we deal with PE files, oftentimes the downloading of that file will generate, um, you know, multiple alerts for that one file download. So I'm gonna grab flow events. There we go, paste that in. So now what I'll do is uh, take a different look at the data and get the, all of the event records just based off of that flow ID. So any record that matched on the flow ID. So here you can see uh, we have our three alerts. Not a big surprise. We've already really kind of established that ground already. Um, but we also have an HTTP event, a file info event, and two flow events. Um, so again, kind of makes sense. We have the establishment of our TCP session. We have our HTTP request to download this payload and um, a file info event that, rep you know, that represents that HTTP response content that also happens to represent the PE file. So what can the file info event tell us? Okay, so my command's getting a little bit longer. Um, still grepping on the flow ID. Just gonna grep one more time 
in order to get the file info record and then JQ it. That didn't work. What did I? I got to change the flow ID, don't I? You can see it coming, right? You know, he, he missed the flow ID, he's gonna hit enter and then go, what went wrong? Whew, there it is. All right, there's our file info. So again, data that you would expect, source desk, um, ports, protocols, flow bits, community ID, the flow ID. We have that some of that original content from the HTTP response that we saw associated with the alert, or it is associated with the alert if I forgot to show it, um, but now we also have the file info. So we have the magic, the libmagic results, we have the MD5, the SHA-1, the SHA-256, and there's some important state information that's presented here. Uh, the biggest one being the state of this file. So by default, Suricata is only gonna read so far into an HTTP response, either the request or the response. So there's a couple places in the configuration that you have to go and look at. Um, I suspect it's for performance reasons, because again, some of these PE files can get fairly large, and if it's reading all the way every time, there's, there's likely gonna be a bit of a performance hit. Um, if the state is truncated, then that just simply means Suricata got to its maximum and stopped. So it took what it could read, it created your hashes, but those aren't proper or accurate hashes. They're accurate for the content that it's read, but it didn't get to the end of the file. So the closed state means that it actually read to the end of the file, and the hashes, therefore, are the actual hashes of the file. So from there, even with a hash, now, of course, if this were an emerging threat, it might be a little bit harder to detect, but something like this, this is, that is nice and old. I forgot to connect to the internet. Well, you'll have to take my word for it. We can find it on the URL house, and you'll see that it not only identifies the original URL that dropped that payload, um, but it has a nice clean tag that says Drydex. Okay, what else did we miss? Well, we had some TLS sessions. All right, and we could use back to our original alerts, we have those JA3 hashes. Uh, again, if we have alerts based off of JA3, we know that there's something to do with uh, TLS. And we can use those flows. Right, there we go, we can see the events. So we have the alert, we have the TLS, we have the flow. Again, uh, probably not a big surprise if we're used to looking at this because we have you know, the TCP establishment, we have the TLS, the session establishment, and that, that TLS record. Uh, so from here, let's grab the flow ID. I have this in my history here somewhere. And I don't necessarily need the flow ID, I guess, for the demonstration purposes. There are gonna be very few TLS records. I could have just, we could just dump all the TLS records, but just so we get the right one. This typing felt so much more fluid on the airplane here. There we 
there we go. Right, so there's information now about that TLS session. So this again is everything that was generated um, that either can be used to generate the alert or just becomes part of the data that you're, you're archiving, you're storing, you have for your visualizations, your dashboards, your any other sort of alerting that you're doing, um, as well as that historical context, being able to go back and see what's happened on a network. Um, some things that stand out with this, uh, uh, certainly there are some more obvious signs that something is a bit askew here. Uh, you know, information here in the subject and the issuer DN. Um, there's also the destination port. Uh, so looking for things that may be showing up or, you know, TLS traffic to non-standard ports. Um, what you'll find with the rule syntax, if we were to go back and look at that, is that the, uh, the, the rule itself, you can say alert TLS and then it will alert on TLS over any combination of ports. You don't have to tie it to a specific port or series of ports. Um, so finding alerts to these non-standard ports becomes quite a bit easier in terms of writing the rules. Having the data, of course, also becomes a bit e easier. Well, whether you have a visualization that's helping to identify these sort of anomalous things or you use something like a, like a Moloch or an Archimede, uh, which again is up and running here. It can be a bit slow, so we'll see if it works. But taking, you know, the data, again, Moloch or Archimy here is, is, is harvesting its own. It's doing its own parsing. It's always its own um, ingestion into Elastic. So Circata really has nothing to do with this. Um, there is an integration to get alert data into Archimy, um, but that's about to the extent of it. Um, but here you can see how easy it is to, to quickly say something like, hey, any, any TLS session that's not over 443, I want to see it. And then you can drill down into it a little bit further from here. Okay, questions so far? Phil, I'm doing good? Just got time? 20 minutes, okay. Phil said the most dangerous thing to an academic. He says, you got extra time. Fill it, can you fill it for me? <laughs> I remember the first time I taught uh, a, like a, an evening class, it was for non-traditional students. You know, so all the working professionals coming in at seven o'clock at night, and it was like a three hour block of time. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna kill this. Uh, about an hour and a half into it, I ran out of material. And I thought, oh, well, you know, they'll be happy that I'm gonna let them go early. And I had so many people pissed off that I <laughs> let them go early. I got rage emails and my boss got called and like, this clown's gonna only use an hour and a half of my time. So the next night we went four hours. <laughs> Okay, I'll get rid of it. Three minutes. <laughs> okay, um, another file that I want to take a look at. Give this a second. Um, this is an, uh, from, uh, from an agent Tesla, uh, a commodity stealer. Uh, I think they actually tried to sell it at some point uh, sort of as legitimate software. I um, believe it's, it's written in .NET. Uh, as recent, or at least in not too distant past, one of their XFIL methods was over SMTP, which, you know, surprisingly enough, was a way to be a bit stealthy, although if you don't have SMT, SMTP in your environment, it becomes quite loud. Um, but uh, not a lot, at least from the, the, in the ET open side, for rules that catch that. And, and again, sometimes these variations in how activity is accomplished, the TTPs, they change just subtly enough uh, that it's, it's easy to miss. Um, you'll see here in just a moment with this one, uh, no signature hits, so uh, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary, although there is in fact some, some very definite XFIL going on here. Look at just the event types. I can do that just because, uh, again, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier looking at PCAPs because we're dealing with a much smaller data set rather than trying to fish this out of, a, of, of a, you know, real network traffic. Um, but some things, you know, certainly stand out here. Uh, we have some DNS entries that might be worth looking into to see what DNS was resolved. More than likely that was, you know, in relation to this SMTP record. Uh, there's some anomaly records as well as some file info. So let's take a look at the SMTP record. And 
and there we go. We can see at least some basic information about it. Uh, certainly seeing things like names of our users or names of our assets in email subject lines going out of the environment is a bad sign. Uh, we can see that here. This is one of my sandbox systems uh, of which my favorite user, John, who is an HR, uh, happened to be a victim of this. It had an attachment, a JPEG file. So again, we can sort of speculate at this point that likely that file info record had to deal with this JPEG file. So, we can move from F SMTP to file info. There we go, we can see file information. Uh, the state was closed, uh, the MD5, uh, the different hashes, uh, it was not stored, right? So even though we're generating file information, um, we haven't extracted any files. There's an extra step that we have to take in order to do that. Um, but it does look like a, a no kidding JPEG file. Uh, if we want to, to do file extraction, it's really a two step process. fighting my urge to use nano. Okay, um, we have to go into the configuration. Uh, and again, most of this is, is pretty well documented. Um, so you go into the, uh, the configuration here, and then we have to enable the file store. So I've already done that, uh, of course, but that's not the default state. Uh, something that you have to do intentionally because you don't want to start extracting files all the time, filling up disk space on, on your sensor. Um, so that's enabled. And then the next part of it is we have to write a rule. Oh, I don't need sudo for that. Okay, so there it is. Very simple rule, not the best rule, uh, but in terms of just getting the file extraction to occur, this will be a good example. Um, the, the action really doesn't matter. We're gonna say alert in this case so that we, we know that, it's, that we've had a file extraction occur. Um, I don't know if it would make sense to say drop, but I, I suppose you could. There's the protocol. So we're looking at just SMTP. We have um, typically where we define our you know, our, our internal external IP space. So what direction in the communication are we looking at? Um, you'll see this commonly with your home net external net, uh, which your home net tends to be your, your RFC 1918, your external of course is anything that isn't that. So you define that for your environment. Um, again, I'll just be lazy, I'll say any, any. So any IP, any port, going to any IP, any port. So whether it's coming in or out. Um, message is arbitrary, that's just what you see when the alert is generated. We have a couple keywords though. One is file store. We have to say file store in order to tell Suricata to store. And then we have to tell it what to match on. So you can match off a file extension, which may not always be accurate. Um, you can match on file magic, which then we're just taking a part of whatever the magic of the file that you want to extract, assuming that that's gonna be you know, concrete and unique enough to give you the extraction that you want. Um, and that's pretty much it. We have a SID, which is our signature ID. We have to define that. And then the revision, which is just one. And now when we run this, assuming I didn't make any typos, what will happen then is we should see um, an alert that is generated indicating that the file was in fact extracted. Uh, now, when it comes to file extraction, the convention that Suricata uses is it takes the first two characters of the SHA-256 and then it creates a folder structure in the var log Suricata folder. So you'll see a file store folder and those first two characters of the SHA-256 is the subdirectories and then it drops the files by hash into those folders. So again, it's not sure the rationale behind it, um, but it is certainly a way to organize that, it is a way to find those, and it is documented. So, let's see what we get here. Okay, so there's an example of permission error. So an error in output was generated. Um, this says it extracted, and I did this previously, so the file should still be there. So. Um, likely what happened is I went ahead and I changed the permissions of the file store director, directory um, and now 
Circata is having issues accessing it. Um, there's a tendency in this VM for everything to just be root and sudo, and I try to get away from that, and I, I think that might have been the problem. So we'll go to where this file should be. Bar log. Where are you? Circata, file store. Uh, I think it was 1B. Yeah, there it is. So there you can see all of the directories, and now we'll be able to find our files. So it'll be written there by hash, and it'll be up to us then to further identify um, what type of file is it and, and what is it do what we actually want to do with it. Um, in this case, it did take a no kidding screenshot of the, the system it was running on, um, which is a pretty boring one. Okay, uh, any questions for me so far? Okay, so uh, obviously doing that all from a command line it does not scale well. Uh, so there's any number of ways to take that data and make it more effective, operationalize it, make it more useful. Um, Evebox is just a project supported by one of the core developers, uh, Jason Ish. He's, he's been on the team for a very long time. Um, it's you know very lightweight. It's easy to set up and run, and you get the basics of managing. It's primarily focused on alert, so it has this inbox approach in which you'll see all of the alerts that are generated here. You have the ability to drill down into those alerts to start to see some of the metadata that's there. Um, if not, you can go all the way down, and all of that JSON, the event record from the eve.json file is also displayed there. So, you know, arguably an easier way to get access to that data. Uh, there's some basic commenting, there's some basic escalation, and all of the, or at least most of the data points here also, um, you know, you're able to, to click on and start to pivot a little bit easier in this interface. So there's a flow ID, for example, we can click on the flow ID, that'll take us to this events page, and now we'll see all of those events just like we saw previously, um, but in a UI instead of in our terminal. Um, not all of it's there, some quirky things that are maybe missing a bit. Um, for example, where's my desktop? There it is. You know, if we look at this SMTP session and something like Wireshark, and I'm sure the data is there, I just haven't found it. Um, you know, of course, they had to authenticate to their servers, uh, so we've captured that information. Um, what you do with it is up to you. Um, I would never authenticate to something like that. But uh, certainly there's some, maybe some additional information that's there. Um, all the event records, again, the ability to query um, some basic reporting. You know, it, it doesn't replace maybe more complex ways of managing these, but it is a great way to get started. And, and certainly one of the reasons um, that we like to use it inside of the, the training VM here. I guess I still have a few minutes, don't I? Okay, well, let's take a look at one more then. Unless you've had enough. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, so while that PCAP gets set up, Okay, so these are, you know, you run across these, um, these, these interesting, you know, documents, malicious office documents from time to time. Uh, 2020 and 21 has been an interesting year because we saw this resurgence of Excel 4 macros, which initially was very different from the normal sort of VBA macro style enabled documents. Um, with the Excel docs being, again, seeing this resurgence, um, 
there was a lot of clever ways that were discovered to get code to execute. Um, some of them, most of them still required some, some form of user interaction, enabling dynamic content, enabling external content or data sources. Um, but definitely there, there were you know, these little oddballs thrown at us pretty regularly. Um, anytime I get an office doc and it doesn't have macros, right, then the first question that pops into my head is, well, what is it used for and how does it get code to execute? Um, maybe it's just meant to be part of a fish, but odds are if I throw it in a sandbox and I see it make an HTTP request to some you know, suspicious looking domain, I know something's up. Uh, this is one document I came across. Again, this technique isn't anything new. Um, it just isn't something that I come across too regular. Um, I don't look at thousands of documents a day though. Um, and it had a, uh, as, a, as, a as an office doc, um, it had you know, no macros. And it's Word. There we go, Word document, Microsoft Word 2007. Uh, but definitely we want to throw it in a sandbox, it exhibits behavior, something's going on. Um, so this was just one of those techniques that I had to stumble across and do a little research. Uh, others, of course, have, have come across this technique and already written blogs and white papers about it. Um, it performs template injection. And so the original document doesn't contain anything but a link to an external resource, which then when you open it, it happily will go and download and then execute any macro content inside that document. So it, you know, it adds a bit of stealth, you could say, and that this original doc, if this is where you stopped your analysis, you'd say, ah, must have been a false positive, maybe somebody didn't understand, whatever the reason, and you might move on. Um, on the network, it leaves some pretty interesting tells. You can see this one generated quite a few alerts, but if we look at the HTTP flows, what really stood out to me, um, you know, if we just take a step back and say, all right, what could be some, maybe some odd things that are going on in our network? Um, well, seeing those verbs, prop find and options and head, um, you know, depending on your environment, that might be something that could stand out. Um, certainly in my sandbox environment, that's something that stands out because I don't typically see that type of HTTP activity. So looking at those, you'll notice that there is uh, you know, a rather suspicious looking domain, doctor.hop2.org. Um, it's making a request for this nd.dot, dot, um, and then eventually we have a request for nd.exe, right? So we can start to piece together what's happening here is that this document is somehow grabbing this document or this thing, and then this thing eventually leads to the download and the execution of our payload. Um, so what is this file? Well, I mean, they kind of give it away with the dot dot extension, but we can certainly go and look at file information events. And we have nd dot dot right here. And our magic says that this is a rich text format, so an RTF doc. Um, it was fully extracted, or at least in this case, we didn't extract it, because I didn't write, I don't have a rule that extracts RTF docs or PDF docs. You saw all I have is a rule to extract that one JPEG. Um, but it did give us the file information. So now we have a solid hash. Um, and because I didn't connect to the internet, I'm not gonna be able to connect to this. Um, I'm always afraid to show what's on my desktop. Okay. I'll give that a second and see if it actually connects. Oh, looks like it, yes. Okay, so we go to a place sandbox, uh, like any run, um, which, while it reports it as suspicious, the only reason it's suspicious is because this DNS request failed. So at the time that this was submitted to the sandbox, the, the DNS was not resolving, so that next stage payload didn't come. Um, I would say word launching equation editor is probably suspicious. That's good old CVE 2017-11882. Um, been around for a while, it's been mitigated and patched for a while, but a lot of those, you know, sort of mid-tier, low-tier threat actor, criminal organizations, whomever, they're still using it, and they're still using it pretty regularly. Um, they must be finding some success out there in the world with it. Um, so RTF doc that was weaponized to use the, the equation editor in order to execute some code and, and download the next stage. So that's how that whole chain unraveled. Um, and, you know, again, this one had some pretty some pretty good alerts. We go back and take a look at those. Um, you know, the PE file download was a big one. 
Again, I don't understand why they don't take just that extra step and obfuscate that. Even if they just flipped the first two bytes in the, 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 the payload response, uh, that would probably bypass a lot of this. Um, you know, they're not using a TLS session, which again, I know a lot of compromised infrastructure, that takes more work, maybe they don't have the ability to. The sites that compromise aren't using it. Um, you know, some of the Dyn DNS, dynamic DNS and things like that, that also becomes a pretty large, you know, at least an indicator that can be more easily alerted on. Um, although, how does that scale in an environment? I, I really don't know. Um, the only thing that is maybe really unique in terms of our alerts to this particular injection uh, is this possible fake Microsoft Office user agent. So, and I, that's a new one. I haven't seen that one before last time I ran this. Um, so, again, you know, having all of that different HTTP information, those verbs, those are things that can really stand out if you're watching for them. Okay, I think I got there. Uh, questions, uh, comments for me? Okay, well, thank you very much again, uh, Doug and everyone, and Phil, um, and thank everyone for your attention, and um, look forward to, to meeting everyone. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much, Josh. Really appreciate it. Am I on? Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Um, so this conference is about community. There's lots of other projects in the community, so I hope you all enjoyed that very much, uh, as, much as, uh, as much as I did. Um, if you want to use Suricata metadata in Security Onion, you can. So if you've installed Security Onion for a long time or had it installed for a long time, you're probably used to using Zeek for metadata, but if you want to use Suricata for metadata, that feature is now available in Security Onion. All you need to do is in the global, global pillar file, you just need to make a quick entry change. Uh, it's, I think it's MD Engine, you change that from Zeek to Suricata. Of course, there's a, there's a whole process involved. You have to, um, you have to you know, do some other things. So if you wanted more information on that, you can go out to our documentation site, that's securityonion.net slash docs, D-O-C-S, slash Suricata. Usually you can do securityonion.net slash docs slash something, and if we have a page for it, if you catch the name right, you might be redirected, you should be redirected to that page. So again, securityonion.net slash docs slash Suricata, and you'll get information there on how to enable just about everything uh, Josh just talked about, right, in, in Security 